Good evening, everyone. It's Tom Sidney Bushnell, aka Numbers, here from Sight Club. And I have a new friend of mine, uh, Miss Lara Logan. She's here on the show with us today. And for those of you that may not know Lara, probably a lot of you do, but some of you that may not, she's an investigative journalist. Um, she's very experienced on major networks. She has dealings with Fox and um, other networks back here in the UK. She's originally from South Africa, uh, lives in the States and has a, a wealth of experience and knowledge. And Lara, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tom. It's good to have you here. Now, people know me as Tom Numbers and uh, they'll see from the intro credits why that is. But for those that are new viewers, uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna pepper in a few numbers as we, as we go through the show. Uh, but when I talk about numbers, what I mean is gematria which is simple gematria, which is A is the first letter, hence equals one. B is second letter, so it equals two. C, three, D, four, et cetera, all the way through to Z or Z, which is letter 26. And I work at the numerical value of codes and names and places and phrases and sentences, things that capture the imagination. And I add a kind of uh, one or two other possible meanings that could be connected to it. So I did your numbers, Lara, to start us off. So uh -oh. Lara comes to 32, <laughs> L is 12, a is one, R is 18, A is one. So that comes to 32. 32 comes to life. Uh, Logan comes to 49, which is yes. And if you add those together, that comes to 81. 81 is tower. It makes me think of Trump Tower. 81 is cousin. I have my cousin Paul I mentioned. Uh, dollars, Tiffany, they all come to 81. But I noticed on your screen, you have Lara J. Logan. And J mm -hmm. is the value of 10. So that takes the value from 81 up to 91. 91, not excuse me, 91 is future. 91 is POTUS. 91 is um, uh, Space Force. 91 is Liberty. Wow. So I thought they were interesting ones as well. So, yeah. So, um, and even <laughs> further, investigative journalist. Investigative is 162. 162 comes to my, my product that I do for, uh, it's a digital download called Trumpology. Uh, it's the numbers around everything and uh, and the ascension and um, the great awakening and Trumpology comes to 162. Um, 162, the 162nd day of the year was the day that I met Ivanka Trump in Manhattan in 2015. Just wow. four, five days before her father and Melania came down the escalators on the 16th of June. So there's all these things that kind of tie in. So uh, there's, that, there's some anything add up to pain in the butt? Say that again. <laughs> Does anything add up to pain in the butt? Because I think that's what I am for a lot of uh, political in figures butt. in the US. Pain in the butt, I can have a look at that. I think <laughs> pain is 40, if I remember rightly. Let's have a look. Pain. In is uh, 23. The is 33. And but, that would be two T's, wouldn't it? But. Yeah. B, U, T, T. So 63, interesting. Uh, that comes to 11 as well, the word 11. Pain in the butt, so pain, I believe, is 40. Let me just check. Uh, yeah, it is. So pain in the butt. 159. 159 comes to, uh, interesting enough, it comes to John F. Kennedy, JR. Uh, wow. It comes to uh, the Chinese elders. Um, Mm. yeah 159 so there's some nice ones there so yeah <laughs> that's amazing and red that you're wearing today is 27 yeah. which is yeah. code which is jfk and uh it's also a is wow. one z is 26 a plus 26 is 27 which is which is uh red so uh yeah, very appropriate, Laura, very appropriate. I'm going to go have a nap now, Tom. That's enough mental gymnastics for me for today. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get into the meat of it. That's an introduction for people like, well, who's, well, who's Tom Numbers? What's he do? That's what I do. So you'll see the links below if you want to know more. But let's get into the meat and breadth of everything with you, Laura. So if maybe that's, I mean, it's always a good place to start. But let's start at your origins. Your origin, your, yeah, at the beginning. Let's go start at the beginning. So take us, so take us from the beginning. What shaped your, where were you born? Uh, what was your family life like? What were the things that's kind of shaped who you are now? 
um, but maybe some of the things you also learned and let go as, as you kind of progressed into into adulthood because we were a combination of both things you know things we were brought up with but things that we also yes. let go of well you know I was born in South Africa and I know in London you have a South African invasion over there so uh, most <laughs> people are very familiar with my kind um, and I, I think when you're born in a, a little place in the middle you know uh, of nowhere in a sense nowhere in yes. that Africa doesn't matter to most of the world um you have a different kind of perspective um because you know that you know that you're of no consequence and that you don't drive and shape world events that comes to you from outside and elsewhere so i, I always feel like i'm extremely lucky to have been born there number one because i was born um you know in the time of nelson mandela and so and he was uh, such a powerful figure that um was such an influence in so many of our lives a real formative influence i think for uh people individuals certainly but for a nation as a whole and i think for people who believe in freedom all over the world and nelson mandela to me only grows in stature by the day because he truly uh, believed he created the rainbow nation in South Africa. He could have burned it all to the ground. He could have taken it all at any price. Certainly there was the moral justification existed, right? But he chose not to. He chose to take the high road. He believed that together, um, you know, Simunye, as they would say in South Africa, we are we are one. And um, And that was... I don't think people really understand that the liberation of South Africa and the rise of Nelson Mandela was as much a liberation for white people as it was for black people in many ways. And there's a lot that's happened since I know it's a complicated history, but I was born sort of into that golden age. I had um, wonderful parents who uh, divorced early on in my life, but um, I always knew we always knew, my brothers and sisters and stepbrothers and half-sisters and all the rest of it, we always knew that we were very, very loved. And so whatever hardship came our way, um, you know, we never had to doubt who we were. Uh, we knew that, you know, we were taught some very uh, practical lessons of life very early on, lessons that I think have definitely shaped my personality and that I'm sort of mystified at why they've been cast by the wayside today. You know, very simple things like you only get out of something as much as you put in. <laughs> the world doesn't owe you a living, right? Mm. And nobody owes you any favors is that you you earn these things. Um, mm. And I mean, these these are simple truths that never, ever, ever change. It doesn't matter if you were born in the time of cavemen or the industrial revolution or in the time of... Uh, you know, of really uncharted waters and tumultuous change that we're living through right now. Those mm -hmm. very simple truths have guided me. I am grounded so deeply in the African soil that gave birth to me. And, and that's why, you know, I just, um, I don't pay much attention to people who look at me and say, oh, well, I've got the wrong color skin, right? You're white, so you can't be African. No, I'm not claiming to be African in the sense of, you know, a Zulu person who was born there, whose ancestors um, have never lived anywhere else. Some, you know, I, some of the Zulu people I know haven't even traveled from inland two hours to the coast and seen the ocean, right? And, uh, and don't even speak any other language, let alone English, right? And so, of course, I'm not claiming to be that, but you don't have to claim to be that um, in order to have, uh, I mean, you're either born of that soil or you're not. It's just a fact. You can't erase that. It's not my truth. It's the truth. So yeah. I was lucky enough to be born into a house where you had to stand your ground. You had to stand up for yourself and you had to know who you were. And um, really, that was an environment in which um, I just took the ball and ran with it. You know, I, um, I wanted always to be a writer. My earliest memories uh, were of words and were of writing. And so, um, and I was, you know, I had parents who loved uh, and valued reading. You know, I'm of that generation. My father subscribed to all the National Geographics and mm. you, were, you were allowed to use them for research, but you were not allowed to touch them, right? You couldn't deface them, couldn't cut out any of those handy images you needed for your school project. Um, and so uh, I had a healthy respect for learning and especially for reading. Um, 
And what that really gave birth to, I think, in my life was someone who at the age of 17, I got a job in a local newspaper when other kids were going to the beach and uh, going out partying and, and clubbing at the weekends every weekend. I mean, I did some of that, um, but mostly I was at the newspaper and I was, you know, my idea of a, of a great weekend or a great uh, vacation of, I, I loved the beach, um, but my second love, uh, the beach and the water, I was a diver, but my, I don't want to say my second love, maybe even my first love was to be at the newspaper and to be working. And on a Saturday night, you know, the way I got, um, the way I got a real uh, understanding of the work and the way I got uh, created opportunities for myself was to volunteer for every, every job that no one else wanted to do. And, you know, sometimes it's as simple as a professional working journalist who has kids at home on a Saturday night working for a Sunday paper. They don't want to have to wait for the first edition to come off the presses and physically carry that to the fire station and the morgue and the hospital and the police station. You know, they, they have other things that they want to do or other places they need to be. But when you're, when you're 17 and you're learning and your country is burning down around you and nobody wants to send a little white girl into townships where people are being butchered and necklaced and burned and, you know, chopped to pieces every day. Well, how are you going to get those opportunities? You have to make them happen. Nobody hands them to you. They don't fall out of the sky. Nobody owes you anything. You don't deserve it because you work hard. You know, you don't just count on getting lucky. You try to make your own luck. And uh, for me, I, I believe that I was motivated by the right things because it was never a desire to be famous or anything like that. It was about I needed to see it. I needed to see it to understand. I was truly lucky to be born in a time of such greatness all around me. I mean, such evil, yes, but such greatness. And what I learned from the people, both black and white, many of them's names were never recorded by history. They taught me everything about uh, what is good, and what is evil. And I think that that's the battle we fight today. I don't think it's changed one bit. And I have traveled a long way since then. I've lived in Paris as a young au pair and, you know, uh, working as a domestic and cleaning, right? And taking care of someone else's child. And I've worked in restaurants. I moved to New York when I was 18. I moved to Paris when I was 17 in a time when there was no internet and uh, no cell phones, no email, no text, where you know, you, you had coins and you put them in a, a pay phone. And by the time you got to say, hello, mom, it had run out of money. It was beeping and it had run out. And that was all you got to say. I love you. And yeah. goodbye. And maybe you didn't call again for a month. I think yeah. sometimes it was two months. So I got a real sense to be alone in New York city or to be alone in Paris with nothing, with very little money to know no one, to have no connections, to have no foundation, to have no one to call, nowhere to go, you know, other than that tiny little patch of ground. I had a, a chambre de bonne in Paris, which is a maid's room, which was a one tiny one room with a single bed. I shared a, a, a bathroom with, I don't know how many other people on the floor. Mm. Um, and that bathroom was a hole in the ground. Was, the toilet was a hole in the ground. Can't believe we did that in Paris mm. in 1989. Um, and I think those places are still there today. I think there are people working um, and living in those maids' rooms and the top of those beautiful buildings in Paris that tourists go and see who have access to a one cold water tap in a tiny little sink. I'd have to turn my head to the side and shove it in sideways to get it between the grid and the tap just to wash my hair. So, you know, but I, I, I think when you have hope, when you know that you have within you the ability to change um, your circumstances and, uh, and improve, and that it's not going to be forever. It's a very different existence to people who struggle and live through that day in and day out with very little chance of it ever changing. And, I, and that hope um, and that ability to, that through the means that I possessed, right? I didn't have connections. I didn't have loads of money. I didn't, I mean, I was very lucky in South Africa coming, you know, very privileged in the sense that as a white person, my life was much better than the average black person. 
However, we didn't come from lots of money. And, and so I didn't have any of those things, but I knew that with hard work and with skill and with determination and tenacity, and, you know, if I never accepted defeat and if I, um, if I did everything humanly possible, that things would get better. Mm -hmm. And to take that away from people, I think is a death sentence. And the only way that you can really have those things, I mean, to me, there's no place on earth um, that represents that freedom and that opportunity more than a free country. Yeah, mm -hmm. the United States, of course, but it's not the only place on earth where that's possible. It's just the place that really defines that. And so um, it was sort of inevitable for me that my path would take me. I went to Europe, of course, um, and I ended up uh, working in the UK. Some of your audience, I don't know, yeah. maybe they're uh, too young, but some of them may remember that I was at GMTV for a long time. I lived in London. I lived in Bayswater before it was cool when they, right, actually yeah. before Notting Hill came out and uh, during Notting Hill and then after that. But then I moved to a small village, Crowthorne, uh, in Southeast London, not far from Bracknell. And um, I lived in Milton Keynes for a while. I spent 10 years living in London, working at GMTV um, and then working freelancing at CBS and other places. But I think what people don't really understand is I always took myself to the story. You know, I made friends, I made contacts, I worked for nothing. You know, uh, when I came back from working in Paris, I went to the biggest daily newspaper and I said, look, you've got nobody my age on your staff. You need young readers. Let me write for you and you can pay me if you like. Don't pay me if you don't want. It doesn't matter. You know, and that's how I basically talked my way into every job I ever got until I interviewed at GMTV. I had never done a job interview before and I sucked and I walked out of there humiliated and embarrassed and thought I was never going to get that job. And they gave me a shot, you know, and that led to me freelance. Well, I'd already been freelancing for the American networks in London. I was working for anyone who would hire me. And, um, and then I worked at GMTV and they were fantastic to me. You know, they, I went all over, I went to Mozambique during the floods. It was through them. I said, let me go to Afghanistan. The moment 9-11 happened, I said, let me go. And it wasn't easy getting to Afghanistan. And so um, at first they didn't want me to go because it was too dangerous. And then as it got, the story got bigger and bigger and bigger. They were like, you think you can get in? You really think you can? And I said, yes. And, uh, and so I went and, you know, through that work, I ended up, um, well, I ended up at 60 minutes. I was really the first non-American to be on 60 minutes. The first non-American Canadian to be on American networks. CNN was around at the time. There people like Christian Amanpour, but in the US it was such a big deal, the difference between a cable news operation and a network, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was really the first there. And, and although it's kind of commonplace now, nobody who looked like me went to war zones and was a war correspondent. You had Kate Aidy from the BBC mm -hmm. and you had Christiane and there were some people in the European networks, but it was really still the domain and the stomping ground, you know, of the alpha male, uh, which I which I understand, actually. It didn't bother me in the least, but um, but I knew that I could just by getting to the places that most other people couldn't get to or being there in the right moment um, or having the right idea, figuring out the right story. I just made it so that uh, most of the time when I got an opportunity, it was because I was offering something that either nobody else had or almost no one had, you know? And I um, ended up at 60 Minutes and was there for 16 years, was the chief foreign correspondent for CBS. And then- uh, Where was 60 Minutes uh, based at that time? Or still is, I, where, where was it based? In New York. It so is in New York. I lived for five years in Baghdad. Um, you know, people are looking at me probably uh, wondering, you know, but I started when I was 17 and I'm 50, almost 51 now. So it's been a long time. It's been a long time, 34, 35 years. 78, 17 plus 51 is 78, Kennedy. Very interesting. Yeah. Nice. I look back mm. at pictures from Afghanistan when I was first there right after 9-11 and I cannot believe how old I am. <laughs> I don't know where it went. 
Well, you've had a good paper round, though, Larry. You still look great. So, well done oh, to you. That's because I'm fat. <laughs> that's my trick as well. Keeps life. me young. Keeps me young. So, I, something we spoke about when we spoke a few weeks ago. Um, one of the one of the things that really caught my imagination is we were talking about James Bond and about George Washington, and there was a lot of. Are you still there? Yeah. Yes, I'm sorry. It was a low battery. Oops. Oh, okay. Do you need to plug in or are you okay? Mm, I probably need to plug in. Uh, I don't want to take away from this, but I don't want it to die, right? Yeah, no, that's okay. Take your time. All right, listen. My my puppy will keep you company. No, she won't. She'll never stay here without me. I'll be right back. Awesome. I'll be right back. Yeah, some interesting numbers that, that Lara shared with us, actually. South Africa, South is 83, Africa is 38, 38 gold. But South Africa comes to 121, comes to Golden Jubilee, comes to Revelation, uh, comes to Second Coming. She mentioned Rainbow Nation. Rainbow is 82, Soldier Nation, 73. That's 155, the Millennium. The Rainbow Nation is 188. That's uh, President Kennedy, Close Encounters. No, Jesus so some interesting numbers there um and uh what was this one yes. okay i need to read my writing Ugh. honey hold on you oh boy i was going to say something i should not say on youtube wait no, hold on okay. i'm almost there I was just talking to the audience while you're getting your battery, um, Lara, and some interesting numbers that you said. So South Africa, Africa's 38 gold, and uh, South is 83, so South Africa is 121, Golden Jubilee. Uh, Gotham City, a lot of inspiration of Gotham City comes from New York. You mentioned New York. Uh, 121 is also second come in, it's Revelation. And you spoke about the Rainbow Nation. Rainbow is 82. 82 is also soldier. You've been in the war zones a lot. Uh, nation is 73, which is number. It's Egypt, it's children. But Rainbow Nation is 155, which is uh, the millennium. The Rainbow Nation is 188, which is President Kennedy. Uh, Jesus for Nazareth. Uh, close Encounters and Show Me the Money. Um, you said you were a diver, 58 star, uh, Nessara, Evonka, XRP. Um, yeah, and you said 17, you started when you were 17, you're 51 now, 17 plus 51 is 78 Kennedy. So anyway, let's get back to, to where wow. we were. So, so sorry um, about that. That's, that's all right. That's, that's I don't nice know how you do all break. those numbers so quickly. What's that? I don't know how you do all those numbers so quickly. I know it's just just yeah just uh it comes in it's kind of a download a gift you know and just practice and but that yeah there's a natural I guess inclination to it so um but That's James good. Bond James Bond um you uh we mentioned you mentioned uh when we were talking before and uh there was a connection with with uh with Washington, uh, or was it Lincoln? It was one of the presidents, but I, I wanted to go into that if we can track- It's we Washington. Could, it was Washington, yeah. So if we can go mm -hmm. into that. And you you kind of really caught my attention with that. So I just want you to kind of let rip on on that, all that info and story that you know about, because I don't think I've ever heard it anywhere before, so. Well, what, you know, people talk a lot about QAnon and to be honest, um, I never paid a lot of attention to QAnon because uh, I, I mean, you know, it's been so difficult these last few years. Every story has been sort of just uh, buried under layers and layers and layers of deception. And there's been such an enormous machinery that's marshaled against you. If you challenge the status quo on anything, um, mm. cancel culture obviously being, you know, prevalent all over the world, that it's quite overwhelming. 
And to do real investigative journalism is is very, very time consuming. And mm. to and to really vet things out and to form relationships and to, you know, uh, and to make the connections. And I mean, it's it's so labor and time intensive that it just wasn't something that was in my realm. Um, and so, um, you know, I uh, I really wasn't even very much aware of QAnon until it was right in the, the sights of, mm. um, <laughs> you know, of the various entities uh, within this country today, within the US today, who yeah. want to target parents as uh, domestic terrorists and, um, and everybody else, right? And the same with QAnon. And you'll notice that there was, um, they announced that QAnon was a terrorist organization. And then very quickly within like two weeks or something, uh, the investigation was quietly closed and just went away. So that's a real red flag, right? It's nothing definitive, but it's a real red flag. And what I, when I started to uh, look at this um, a little bit, what I learned was that there is a, a real distinction between Q and QAnon and trying to understand, well, what on earth, what is Q? What, where does it come from? What is this about? What is this thing that everyone's talking about that's now suddenly a, a terrorist threat to the nation, right? And um, uh, when you start to look at it, what you find, the first thing that you really discover that is not a secret at all, um, but is not necessarily widely known is that Q is the highest level security clearance designation in the United States of America for national security. And a lot of people think, will say to you, oh, that's for the Department of Energy. DOE is a Q clearance. Well, actually, Department of Energy is only one part of national security. So while that's true that in the Department of Energy, you do at the highest levels have uh, people with a Q clearance, it doesn't only mean the Department of Energy. And then when you start to look a little bit um, behind that, what you what you can discover if you are paying attention and uh, you talk to the right people is that the uh, Q was originally um, <laughs> comes from uh, the Gnostic Gospels mm -hmm. of Jesus Christ, which is the last gospel of Q, which yeah. is where uh, the link to George Washington comes in because uh, George Washington chose that designation because of uh, the connection um, to the last gospels of Jesus. And um, some of this, you know, is even though it's classified, it's been leaked onto uh, the internet and it depends, you know, it comes up, it goes down, it, um, it's out there and then it disappears and then it's out there and then it disappears. So I don't know what's out there at the moment, but, um, but if you look, uh, going back, you know, it's, it's uh, not a secret that George Washington was the first spy master of the United States. In fact, um, the Culpa Ring, named after um, a, a man called whose last name was Culper, um, was one of either the earliest or one of the earliest spy rings in the United States. And um, as are the, they are famous for being uh, the first American spies and Washington spies during the um, uh, during the early 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 uh, wars, right during the Civil War. In fact. AMC made a TV series called Turn, um, which was about the Culper Ring and about Washington's first spies. And it's really fascinating um, if you watch it with that perspective, because you can see how these compartmentalized rings um, uh, were created in order to, um, at that time, protect Washington's army from the British. And remember, this is the era of Benedict Arnold, right? Who was one of Washington's generals who was, um, who, who was very close to him and then turned out to be um, spying for the, um, for the British, it turned out to be a double and betrayed him and betrayed his country. And, you know, when we look at the United States today, it's easy to gloss over the degree to which Washington was isolated and abandoned by many, um, not that long before he overcame the British and won that war. And so um, what you, the part that I alluded to, which I said is up and down on the internet, which you might mm. be able to find, I want to choose my words carefully because of the, um, 
because of the uh, secrecy around it. Um, but this goes back to basically Northern Virginia. Washington was very interesting because he would attend uh, two church services every Sunday. And what, the first he would go to Christ Church in Alexandria, Virginia, and he would, uh, that was where he would worship. And mm -hmm. according to, according to soldiers who followed Can in his footsteps in the organizations that he created, he and the founding fathers created and established in the constitution, um, this was a sacred place in a sense, historically, and uh, almost as a rite of passage too. Um, because afterwards, after worshiping at Christ Church, Washington would go across to the Lutheran Church, which they say um, was known to them as the home of the Illuminati and how Washington regarded it. And that is where Washington would collect information on the people he regarded as the enemies of the United States. And, you know, um, if you think about it, it's not, um, it's not that hard to see the, the evolution of history there because going back to Bavaria and uh, Weishaupt, uh, who established the Illuminati, why did uh, Weishaupt establish the Illuminati in Bavaria? He did it because the Freemasons at the time were the most powerful secret society. And he created the Illuminati to take away some of their power, right? To counter the power of the Freemasons. And how did he do that? I mean, one of the big ways was to um, infiltrate the Freemasons and to turn Freemasons from within, right? And recruit them from within over to the Illuminati. So, I mean, this history um, of uh, competition and rivalry and clandestine activities and spying between um, the Freemasons and the Illuminati um, really goes back uh, a long, long way. And so um, it is taught down in history of Washington and those who followed in his footsteps and in the footsteps of the Culper Ring, that those roads lead back uh, to his army in Northern Virginia. And um, one thing that I've been working on, and it's very difficult to get to the bottom of all of this and be definitive about it, but what I've been able to um, uncover so far, and I haven't put it out, um, I haven't put all the evidence out publicly, is um, I don't know if QAnon began as um, an extension of, of Q. Um, I don't know if they have nothing to do with each other from the very beginning, but it's very clear that QAnon over time uh, seems to have been uh, infiltrated or taken over um, in some respects and used uh, to discredit um, Q, really. And if you look at, of course, in the modern day application of all of this is that you have, uh, you have Washington's spies, you have mm. the spy masters, and of course, uh, they always have their Q, which if you look at the James Bond films, of course, Q is short for quartermaster. But what is the quartermaster mm -hmm. doing? The quartermaster is in a way, right, strategically and operationally calling a lot of the shots and making a lot of things possible and engineering a lot of things. So, you know, the idea is that behind uh, the spies who are out there, doing what they're trained to do there's a, a quartermaster q who has a broader view because when things i mean in the clandestine world in order for things to stay to succeed or to stay uh, to be successful there has to be operational security and in order to have real operational security you have to have uh, compartmentalization i mean it's not uncommon if you're talking about people with a security clearance, you know, top secret, secure, compartmentalized information, TSSCI and above at the Q level, you could you could work in an office and have no idea who's in the office next to you, 
um, either to your left or to your right. And it could be that way for 15 years. You know, I mean, when you really are talking about sort of the inner le levels of how these um, organizations work, that is, uh, that is what you, I mean, you need to survive, right? Because people, uh, people talk and people get discovered and people leak things and uh, people, rings get infiltrated and so on and so on and so on. So that compartmentalization at the end of the day is what really is, can be the difference between life and death and success and failure. That's really interesting. You talked about the quartermaster. Every um, bond has its queue. Yeah, everyone has its queue. And, and um, you mentioned at the beginning of, um, of our conversation today, Laura, so Q is the 17th letter. So Q equals 17. And you started your career at 17. You went to Paris at the age wow. of 17. Um, the did. word, yeah, the word Paris comes to 63. That always makes me think of, well, the number 11 comes to 63. Um, JFK, shortly before his assassination in 63, he had the silver order, which was a... Uh, one 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 zero so 11 11 11 times 11 again is 121 we've mentioned 121 already with yourself um and uh, you talked about and the other thing as well with this so if you say the word 17 17 comes to 109 109 comes to zapruder the zapruder film 109 comes to diana spencer she was her funeral service um in westminster abbey westminster abbey actually is 200 which is actually also Mount Rushmore. It's also like a thief in the night. But um, her ah. funeral service started, yeah, started at 9.08 in the morning, which is a strange time to start anything, really. It's at 9 o'clock, 9.15, 9.30, maybe at a real push, 9.20, but unusual. But 9 Was that officially at 9.08? They weren't late? That's when, it, well, it looks like it officially started. That's, that's what's recorded online. So, I mean... That's, that's the time it started, but 9.08 is, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't be late for something like that, would you? You know, that would be, it was, it's, it's a deliberate so. time. Yeah, it's a, I think it's a deliberate time because it's made mention. If it was late, they'd sweep it, but it, it's officially recorded as 9.08. And I didn't have to dig it hard for that. You know, anyone could find that. So I feel that that's a deliberate marker. So nine plus eight comes to 17, um, mm. which is Q. And, uh, Wow. Also, Althorpe apparently is a is a the island that she's supposed to be uh, buried on is a is a is a small circular island with a kind of squiggly path going through it. And then you look at JFK Eternal Flame, and uh, the aerial view of that is a clear cue. It's a very round circle with the flame at the top. I was there in Arlington in September, took a video of it, and then there's a there's a path breaks off which is which is the stem of the queue um the word 17th comes to 137 that comes to uh washington dc washington comes to 130 130 comes to the kennedys um uh i think i mentioned zapruder is 109 the film um uh my channel site club is is 109 interesting enough youtube is actually 109 um but you mentioned quartermaster, which I hadn't looked at before, but quarter is 100. Are you still there, Laura? Yes, sorry. How do you stop people from messaging you when you're in the middle of something like this? Oh, uh, you probably have to unplug and then turn it on to like, um, do not disturb mode. But if it's one or two, I think it will be okay. Um, but quarter quartermaster. Is one, yeah, so quarter is 100. 100 is reversal. Uh, master is 76, which actually comes to a magic wand. President Trump spoke famously about, I guess we have a magic wand. A ma magic wand is 75. He's age 75 right now. He will be 76 this year. A magic wand, excuse me, is 76. Makes you think 1776. You know, 1776. Oh, the Constitution. Yeah. Add those together, comes to 93. 93 comes to Flotus. It comes to kingship. It comes to Nazareth comes to my last name interest enough bushnell uh thomas is 76 um ripple the coin is 76 um contact in terms of that great film 
um, with Jodie Foster and Matthew McConaughey is 76. And But if you add those together, quartermaster, 100 plus 76, it comes to Back to the Future 176. Um, and so that caught my attention when you talked about that and the quartermaster and, and another reference to Q, because I've got a lot of references on some of those classic films from the 80s and 90s, Back to the Future, Matrix, Terminator, even Dirty Dancing, Notting Hill, that in my opinion, they're all loaded with Q references. Um, really? And, yes. Yeah. Well, I'll give you an example. So Back to the Future, the, the um, Emmett Brown comes to 148. He's Doc Brown. He's the, he's the guy that invented time travel. Yeah. And he, and he says... He says to Marty, Marty 77, which is actually Christ, uh, comes to the same value, power 77, hertz, like for frequency 77. But he says, um, he says, ah, November 5th, 1955 is the year I invented time travel. So November 5th is 143. 143 comes to uh, Melania Trump. It comes to Trojan Horse. It comes to... Um, uh building seven comes to ground zero it comes to my cousin's name paul bushnell and that's where i got my first number code in 2015 when i met avonka just on the by just going from uh the tip of manhattan to the statue of liberty i had a, a numerical experience which was, i didn't really understand it but i figured it was from him who'd passed just recently but um 143 so is november 5th and there's the whole thing in england of remember remember the 5th of november the I remember that. Plot. You remember that. And mm -hmm. then 1955, if you do the numbers on that, comes to 194. 194 actually comes to um, New Yorker Hotel, which is where Tesla lived for 10 plus years or so. Yes, before he in amazingly managed to throw himself out of the window and kill himself, even though he was under 24 hour surveillance by the FBI. Yeah, and Nikola Tesla is 119, which is redemption. Uh, 119 mm. is Foundation, 119 is Mary Magdalene, 119 is Star Wars, you know, Star Wars, or President Trump uses kind of Star Wars vernacular when he says Operation Warp Speed. I mean, what on earth is Operation Warp Speed, really? Warp Speed is, um, is 107, which is Trump's, which is currency, which is quantum, which is um, Aquarius. So, so, Tom, mm. I see all these references, right? Mm. But I mean... Um, what does it all mean? I think it, what it means is it's, it's a, it ties the other pieces of, of the board together. Not everybody can see it, um, but for me personally, it adds, it adds uh, depth and perspective and, and connection in terms of all these other things. That, so the way it works with the numbers with me is I don't use a computer because people can go online and they can type in a word and, or a number and they'll get you know, loads of values. I don't use those. I just, I go about my day. I think of things, things pop into my head, something kind of in my real world grabs my attention. I work out the numbers on it and I, and I, and then I kind of just try and connect the dots like I did with you today, quartermaster. I didn't know what that was, but it's one, seven, six and it's back to the future. And then you are talking about the spying and then it's like, okay. So I personally believe that things like time travel are possible. Uh, 125 is a Q post, which is dark to light, comes to 125. 125 comes to 8th Avenue, where Tesla's hotel is. Uh, 125 comes to John Kennedy. Um, so I see these things and I don't, you know, I don't know why they kind of just come to me. And, and it, I guess it's amazing. Yeah, it's a blessing. It's, it, 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 it gives me confidence and faith in the future. And and reassurance because let's face it it's a pretty it's a pretty confusing set of circumstances that we're in because there's so many people saying you know you know over here hear me or over yeah. here and there's so many within yeah. the movement within the media within culture within families within people's own yeah doubting opinions even within their own mind it's, it's it's we've never really seen a time like this where there's so much conflicting information and i don't say to people oh you believe me i say this is what i see these are some parallels these are some connections i've noticed and if they run with it great and if they don't then they don't and if it adds a few percentage points to their to their faith and reassurance then great and if it doesn't it doesn't um but there's yeah. so many pieces of conflicting information and you talked about it you know you had spies that 
were double agents, then there's probably triple agents. There's probably some that are flip flop back and forth, and then maybe they're on their own one. And how do we actually know that other than deep investigative journalism? But I'm sure you've come to some dead ends or some twists along your journey, <laughs> as I have. Oh, you know, countless. Exactly. Countless. So we're always faced and, and with you, that. You know, it takes a long time to even know what's right in front of you, right? And exactly. then, uh, and then also you can confirm things that are true, but sometimes you don't know why they're that way. And sometimes yeah. they may be true, but they, you know, like a great example is I see people, especially the Guardian newspaper is one of them and many others, you know, they write about Michael Flynn all the time. Like, you know, Flynn did this and Flynn did that. And, uh, and, and they write with such certainty that they know everything. Yes. But how do they know that Flynn didn't allow himself, uh, didn't give himself up as bait? How do they know that Flynn didn't set a trap for them? He was the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency. He was the spy master of uh, America. Yeah. You know? I'll tell you, tell you another one in terms of newspapers, um, Lara. So you'll know the Daily, well, you'll know the, the, uh, the Daily Star, the red paint, you know, the tabloid newspaper here. Yeah. And most people think that's kind of the, the trashiest and most disbelieving and comical newspaper. Probably mm -hmm. comparable to, say, the Enquirer in the US. I know that's kind of the sure. magazine, but I've actually noticed that the Daily Star, in my understanding through the numbers, show um, people a lot of the truth of the Great Awakening, which sounds bizarre, first of all, but what they're able to do, because of the level that people kind of regard that, they're able to put images, they're able to put pictures, they're mm -hmm. able to put you know, cartoon images out there all the time. They've been talking about alien reveal stuff a lot a lot they've been talking i mean they've shown pictures of putin so do you or um, do you want to know what that's called tom in information warfare terms propaganda no it's called shaping shaping operations to prep the battlefield so right. uh basically what you're doing is is you and it's also about controlling the narrative right so if you think about it, some of these things are so um, enormous in scale in terms mm -hmm. of the depth and the breadth of the deception mm -hmm. that it's impossible to stop some of it coming out. It's impossible to stop people uncovering one or another part of it. So what you do is you, you control both sides of the narrative. So on the one hand, you've got, the, you know, it looks like you've got the star on one side. Mm -hmm. And you've got the, you know, the Guardian and the Independent and whatever it else, it, uh, you know, the Telegraph yeah. um, and so on on the other side. But actually, if you go to the layers behind them, what you often find, and I'm not saying this is the case with the star, but what you often find is that the, the pool of money or power that's f powering and fueling both of those narratives comes from the same place it's just like uh, you know i was just speaking uh, to a number of different people who, who no longer believe that there are two parties in the u.s they believe the democrats and the republicans they call them the uniparty what are they yeah. really talking about that's exactly what they're talking about where um the illusion you know, of choice. If, yes and so a great example is right after trump was elected uh, the former deputy national security advisor ben rhodes came out he did this in the long interview with uh, New York Times magazine in which he described in detail uh, how the Obama administration had lied to the American people about negotiations with Iran, how they'd pretty much, I mean, the things that he said that they were doing and the time when they were doing it, those things were illegal because of sanctions and so on and so on, negotiating with basically the, the number one state sponsor of terrorism. And, and uh he mocked the media. He talked about how they planted, you know, certain things with idiot journalists that they knew would just parrot out what they said and all the rest of it. And, you know, on the one hand, uh, you look at this and you think, goodness, why would Ben Rhodes admit to doing that? Why would he tell everybody that that's what they did? I mean, uh -huh. they kept it secret all that time. And now here he is. And, you know, of course, um, uh, he took uh, he took sorry, he, he took a couple of hits, you know, um, for, you know, a couple of days doing that. But what does it allow them to do? They know that with a new administration in power who, where they don't control everybody just yet, and especially since Mike Flynn, 
was the debt was the national security advisor at the time they know that they're going to be exposed and rather than have it be headlines in the media that some intrepid journalism even in you know uh, sort of a left-leaning paper or whatever is going to expose that so they make sure that they control both sides of that narrative then on top of that they discredit the staff right they fill those pages with some things are totally bogus some things are ridiculous i mean some things are so over the top and so they bury that information in a sea of uh of things that are not credible whatsoever and yep. they permanently taint those ideas and that knowledge and that evidence whatever it is they permanently taint it and so the effect which they know because this is what they intended to do is no leader dares to talk about it because then they're as crazy as the star. No journalist will touch it because it's been in the star. Why would I do that? You know, I'm at you know the London Times or I'm at the yeah. Guardian and the Independent. I'm better than that. And yeah. um, and so you know, for in a sense, it's um, it's where the truth goes to die. Because yeah. even though it's coming out there and people know it, look at the extension of that. Is anyone who believes it? is a conspiracy theorist. Anyone yeah. who's a conspiracy theorist is now a white supremacist and a racist and a liar and insane and so on and so on. So now you can have all kinds of things coming out. And what they've done to the star, they've done with Fox News and uh, you know the Gateway Pundit and Zero Hedge and you know Ben Shapiro and all these other outlets um, in the US. If you are conservative, if you are right leaning, if you are center right, or if you're just plain not on the radical progressive globalist team, you are now you are now pushed to the fringes of respectable society. Uh -huh. And you are now a lunatic. And not only are you a lunatic, look where we are, have gone very quickly, you're now pushing misinformation and disinformation which means you're a danger to our democracy, you're a threat to our society, you're a terrorist threat, a domestic terror threat, a national security issue. And now we can justify putting you in jail, in detention without trial, and so on and so on and so on, freezing your bank account, um, you know, and literally excommunicating you from the society that's in control. Because you know, um and the other thing as well, I was going to say about the star, like you say, they, you know, they, they make it so kind of unbelievable and they put certain messages in there and then it gets, you know, it gets the connotations of everything else. One thing that I do think is redemptive, though, is people are beginning to wake up and they, in terms of social norms, don't get me wrong, still the majority of people are so concerned about how they fit in, what's popular, you know, and it takes a certain ilk of person to have the courage to stand kind of, you know, to be the poppy, the, you know, the, the what's the phrase the red poppy or the, the flower in in the the one and only in, in a whole society of of, of, uh, of, one, of sorry, yes 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 but the other thing that i've with, with the with the star is because it's visual that message goes in whether they like it or not it's like it's like in advertising and yes. branding. so so that goes in or not whether people pay attention to it and it's only a small outlet but another thing with it as well is daily star comes to uh 51 58 which again is 109 which is 17. so that newspaper is 109 is 17 it's a Bruder, it's uh, diana spencer it's um um youtube site club my channel um but it's and it's also daily is is 51 which is jasara 58 is nesara um yeah. and I mean, this sounds kind of, I've done videos on it before, but that was the first paper that put the thought into my head that there were actually two Trumps, because there are at least two of them. When you look at, there's different images of different characters. Um, and, I, and that freaked me out when I realized that. I was like, what? Because they did a picture of a, of a guy in China that apparently looked, he was a Chinese looking Trump. And I was like, and then I saw it. I saw the space. If you look at the video, the Space Force flag ceremony, it was yeah. my very first Cyclone video I did. Um, and uh, the POTUS, the one that would be in the in the Oval Office signing executive office, office uh, executive orders, is distinctly different in appearance from 
the real Donald Trump that we would see a lot of the other time, particularly one that would come off the plane and talk to the press, you know, outside where the plane was, where Air Force One was. Those two, and you could tell because their eyes were different. So one of them was like that, and one was like that, kind of had smiley eyes downwards, real Donald Trump. And then POTUS, as I would call him, his eyes would go slightly upwards. And I think there's been other Maybe versions of Maybe just had well. that as Botox in the one picture, Tom. Not just the one picture, though. It's no, multiple, just, multiple videos. I'm just teasing you. But multiple, but multiple. But the thing is, what I'm saying is that newspaper was the first one that alerted to me. They didn't say, oh, there's two. They didn't say there's two Trumps. Yeah. What they did is they put an image, a comical image, but of a real right. apparent guy in and China. And another one next to it. Well, they didn't even do that. They just had it. It was done in such a way that it was like, huh, a Chinese. And then a few days later, I find this video of the space force flag ceremony which was months beforehand and i did a video about it but then because trump was on tv every day at that point during the early you know early 2020 yeah. i could see the i was like hang on and I, for a few days that just really freaked me out I was like what on earth is going on um but subtle things like that like you say in broad and kind of a mess but certain nuggets of and people could still dismiss that it's up to the, you know it's their opinion that's okay but for me i saw that and it was a visual image. And then I saw another version of it sitting in the White House. I'm like, what the heck? Um, and even with Putin, you know, they, they've been com making comparisons of him being um, uh, an alien. Uh, Star the Space Force flag logo is, is exactly the same. The symbol is exactly the same as the Star Trek one. So they've done comparisons on that. And you look at old Putin and new Putin, they look like two different people. And yeah, you've got the joke of the Botox, but they're, they're putting these things as visual images. They're not telling you, but they're showing it. And it's like, mm. and, so, and people can believe what they want about that. But what I'm saying is they're putting those things out in, the, in that periodical, particularly the, the star, the da more daily star, 109.17. And it's the source of, it. in my opinion, it's got, it's got nuggets of truth that I'm, I'm not seeing anywhere else. So I just want to know what the, I just want to know what the hell's going on at the end of the day i just want to know what it is and there's so yeah. many pieces back and forth so when i get a trigger and i look at something and then i'm like hang on i do look at comparisons of what did this guy look here what does he look like now and they're two different beings you know and then they're connecting with uh the potential of space force and aliens and explosion some will rubbish that completely and that's okay that's fine but i'm looking at it and it's like okay and you can see it. People look and do their research. They can see there's definitely a distinct Putin from when he was younger with Yeltsin to the guy now is a completely different person. You can see it in the face. Well, what I can tell you about that is I, I haven't looked at it closely, so I'm not familiar with, you know, the specific examples that you're giving. I mean, um, when it comes to doubles, it is, uh, you know, it's um, it's an old intelligence and national security thing if you have you know saddam hussein had doubles right mm. he had people who tested his food he had people who were doubles i mean if you think of it it's like a decoy so in some respects um it's not as fantastic um as it might sound to some people right um now maybe that's different when there are security issues and a dictatorship and a this and a that but you know if you think about it there's um Oh, sorry. I'll go back there. Uh, All right. Um, let me get that. If if you think about it, there's there's doubles of everything. For example, there were two White Houses, right? Because one is the building that you know where the president lives, and another is where the Secret Service and other um, organizations train in uh, in how to protect that building and how to protect the president and how to where's, evacuate. Where's that? How to do this. That's new to me. Laura. I've seen, I know this TV set ones like there's the, um, oh, what's his name in Atlanta? Uh, Perry, Tyler Perry Studios, there's a White House there. There's well, the Castle no, Rock yeah, one in LA. That wasn't a TV these, set. But, that was a secondary. These two, yeah, so tell us more about that. That was that's a secondary White House location uh, where training was done um, that well, Obama the Tyler, sold. The Tyler Perry one you're talking about. Yeah. He sold it to Tyler Perry. Uh, That's what I understand from uh, various operational and intelligence sources. Um, so when you say you know, he, who, who sold it to Tyler Perry? Obama did. If you right. look at the year that it was sold, there, there, you know, 
I will say there are a lot of uh, really, really, really extraordinary things that were done during the Obama administration that I really don't think we had any idea what they were about. Yeah. I mean, it was not hidden that they sold this White House to Tyler Perry, right? Um, but, you know, people see that. And I don't know, for some reason, we're so busy with our daily lives or whatever, we don't really question it. But yeah. if you think about it, every significant location in the United States for national security reasons is replicated somewhere else. So you don't only have one nuclear command center. I mean, would that make sense to you? If you had one nuclear command center and for some reason it was inaccessible mm. or it was destroyed or whatever else, would you just everyone say, oh, well, we're screwed? I mean, no, right? That's not what you're going to do. What you're obviously, um, the United States, and I, I imagine they're not the only country, although I haven't confirmed that, but I mean, it doesn't make sense that they'd be the only country. They have secondary locations that mimic exactly that. I mean, some of it is for training purposes, some of it's for, I mean, all of it is for security in a way. Um, and some of it, uh, you know, is for reasons and things that are just unknowable to us. And I think what you hinted at there is that there's just a lot that's unknowable, right? I know there's a lot of talk about, about aliens and uh, I, you know, we really don't have that knowledge in our hands in order to prove something one way or another. So at a certain point, it comes down to what you believe in. So some people will look at it and say, we can't possibly be the only living. We are a, a tiny speck in the galaxy. Uh -huh. Why would we be the only planet with life on it? You know, and then other people will say that that's crazy. One of the things that we can't, what are the things we do have, right? What do we have? Well, we know, we know that this is the aliens, for example, has been an ongoing mystery for a very long time. We know that George Bush senior, not George Bush, uh, H.W. Bush, but the first one, yeah. that he was on an organization called Majestic 12 when he was at the CIA and that they were responsible for and had access to um, what you know, I'll just pick up there. Sorry, I'm getting 400 calls a minute. Yeah. But we know that George Bush senior had access to um, whatever it is the United States knows about aliens or not aliens, right? Um, we know that he never gave up that information, even though he was asked many times when he was president and afterwards. And because he ran, uh, I believe he ran the CIA. I know uh, he was very senior there, but I'm pretty sure he ran it. I could be wrong. But, um, and what else do we know? We know that after all these decades of obfuscation and mystery, yeah. Suddenly, the Department of Defense won't stop talking about aliens and the possibility of aliens and releasing videos. I mean, that alone is a big red flag for me because it doesn't mean it's not true, but it certainly is a, a significant change in tactic. And that's a verifiable change, right? We can look at it historically and we can look at what they're doing now. What we also know is that our governments, we rely on them uh, to develop technology and solutions, defense and offense that go way beyond anything that we know about. And so, for example, you, you'll hear sightings of, you know, weird sightings of this and that, and it didn't move the way a plane does, and the lights yeah. were this, and the shape was that, and blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, look at the Concorde. When was Concorde put into production? Right. I mean, it was a long, long, it was decades ago. By the time they release Concorde technology into commercial production, it's There's at a least mini 20. Exists still. It was, well, I mean, I'm talking about the New York to London, right? Concord. No, I know. I just said that. There's actually a, I mean, I, I saw it um, not long ago coming in to Heathrow. I, I think it was. There's a smaller Concorde. There's a small. I don't doubt Concord it. That exists, you know? So what you know is that by the time technology is released into commercial production, it is so old that they don't need it anymore. Yeah. Think about that. And then Concord, you know, which cut the flying time between New York and London by staggering amounts, right? Yeah. I mean, people were shocked. Well, Concord's already been in production and been retired and been <laughs> obsolete. Yeah. It was obsolete in, uh, you know, in sort of advanced terms by the time yeah. it came, uh, you know, accessible to you and I, 
right? I mean, it wasn't because it was so expensive. So I never went on it. Um, but you know what I mean? That's my mm -hmm. point. And so uh, while we try to give rational explanations to things that are seen, what I know for certain is that um, there's a whole lot of technology that we know nothing about that could easily explain a lot of what is seen. That doesn't mean, you know, that doesn't mean that I am saying definitively there's you know, no aliens or there are aliens or anything yeah. like that. I have no idea. Honestly, I have no idea and I have no evidence of it myself, but I'm highly suspicious. Just like you said, if there's no truth to what I say, it doesn't mean anything. Why do they bother to censor me? Why do yeah. they care about numbers if it's all a bunch of junk, right? Yeah. Well, why do you, why do you, I mean, I know that sort of the alien mystery has been the gift that keeps on giving. You know, one of the things yeah. they talk about is, is um, the bodies, the carcasses of animals that show up miles away from where they were taken and their blood, bodies drained of blood, right? This is one of the proofs. Well, except if you speak to um, a medic in the special operations community, not there's special operations has is broadly divide is a broad community and there's uh, parts of it that are acknowledged and that are much more accessible. And there's other parts of it that are, are, are you know, unacknowledged and uh, far more, um, they're far more clandestine, right? And they operate at different level under different rules. Well, those guys, when their medics are training, they'll pick up an animal and they'll do surgeries in the air and, you know, all the rest of it. And to do that, to learn and to study and to train, they'll drain the animal of blood. And when they've yeah. removed the organs or done this or done that, then they'll dump it far away from where they took it, hoping that, you know, by the time anyone makes the connection between that animal and where it was taken from, that nobody's going to pay any attention to it. Does that mean that there's a rational explanation for everything? No, but it just means it reinforces, you know, what what is certain is that there's far more we don't know than yeah. what we know. Yeah, agreed. You said just a few minutes ago that you know for an absolute certainty that there's technology way, way in advance from what the public, can you share one or two of those that you know about that, that the public don't really know of? Giving away all my secrets here. Um, not, not all 10 well, of them, but maybe one or two. Okay, all right. Well, here's something mm -hmm. that has been acknowledged now uh, by the US government. In fact, you can find some information about it online. If you look up a FEST team, a fast emergency response team, right? FEST teams were, uh, I mean, I'd certainly never heard of it before Benghazi, um, before the Benghazi attack happened. Cheryl Atkinson was the CBS reporter who first uh, reported on this in a big way. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of back and forth and, and, um, and arguing and, and theatrical performance, quite frankly, in some respects over whether or not the United States could have done anything to save Christopher Stevens, its first ambassador who was murdered in more than half a century, and uh, the other American citizens who were killed in Benghazi during that terrorist attack. And, um, you know, we got all tied up in knots in the media with all these, which plane was where, and which unit was where, and who knew what, and who gave what order, and was it one attack or two, and did they know the second was coming, and all this quite frankly, nonsense, absolute white noise. Because as Cheryl Atkinson reported, we had FEST teams, fast emergency response teams, specifically designed for one purpose and one purpose only, which is to protect US soil anywhere on the globe. What does that mean? US embassies and special mission compounds and diplomatic facilities for whatever nation they belong to, um, they are considered to be on that nation's soil. Mm. So the ground on which the special mission compound in Benghazi stood is considered to be U.S. soil, same for the embassy in Tripoli and so on and so on. So we have teams designed for every continent whose job, whose sole purpose was to respond so quickly that they could get anywhere in the planet, on the planet, anywhere from the United States to that designation in two hours or less. And the first time I heard that, I thought, nonsense, that's impossible. Absolutely impossible. But I can tell you, I was wrong. And I uh, have since spoken to people 
who are on those teams, who are familiar with uh, that technology, who have confirmed that that is the case, and who, let's just say, described being shot into space, launched, like you would launch a missile almost, mm. right? I mean, it's a whole different type of technology and travel that, uh, you know, none of us have ever been exposed to, or most of us have never been exposed to. And, uh, you know, some of us couldn't even imagine. First, so F-E-R-S-T-E-A-M, first, first team, is that how you say it? The abbreviation. Yeah, I mean, they, you know, the way Americans say it, they say fast team, but yeah, but that's the that's the anagram, that's the um, yeah, not the anagram, the uh, acronym, acronym, that's it. So F E R S T E A M. Okay, so literally, they're being shot into space, and so is it kind of a like a small rocket that they're in, or is it is it a source, or is it something else, or I don't know, I don't know. Um, I just know that at a certain trajectory, the floor folds up underneath you and you drop. The floor folds up. That's what I was told. Now, have I seen it? No. Do I trust uh, the various sources? Yes. Huh. That's interesting. That's 87, first team. That's Stella. Hmm. So when you say the floor drops up, that's making me think of like a almost a fun fair ride where they spin you around and then because of the centrifuge pushing you out, the floor drops. You're not talking about something like that because you've said two things. You said it gets no. propelled into space, but then the floor mm -hmm. drops. What do you mean by the, the floor? No, drops? I said then the floor folds up. Sorry, the fl the floor folds up. Meaning what? And meaning there isn't a floor then after that. Okay, so what they can see, they so if you and me were in this, get catapulted into space, then the floor folds up. You're meaning so you we could just see the earth below us, or what? What do you mean by that? Yeah, and 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 that's when you're wondering, why on earth am I doing this? And and you know you can imagine the g forces at that point. Every fluid you have is leaving your body. Wow. And you drop to target. And I, you know, there's a lot I don't know, right? I mean, I'm... Uh, when you say I'm, you drop, you, that, so the people, they drop, because everything's drained out of them, they go into a different state. They drop or the capsule drops with them in it? I don't know. I don't know. Um, but what I can tell you is those teams are made up of individuals who um, have extraordinary uh, um, ability to leapfrog the chain of command and bring like each person represents a certain, you know, somebody will represent basically your air support, right? There'll be a person who's responsible for that, who's able to get you the kind of air support that you need instantly, instead of having to go through the normal um, chain of command and the uh, normal rules of engagement and so on and so on. I mean, you've been, you've undergone specialized training and you have unique abilities to bring to bear whatever asset whatever national you know, uh, defense asset it is that you have been trained in and represent, that you have the ability to bring that to bear very, very quickly. Because you know, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that if your embassy in a foreign land gets attacked and you're going to go in and defend it, it's not gonna help if you get there three days later and then you've got to, you know, it's gonna take you um, all day to call in an airstrike, right? I mean, speed, matters in that situation and so yeah. they create these highly specialized teams which have the right capabilities every capability that they believe that you would need to uh defend that ground that that soil and mm. those teams were never activated during the benghazi attack that team that is specifically trained for that area of the world was never even activated Hmm. And that would be the first call you would make to the guys who you've spent how many, I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars hmm. to train and maintain those teams is an unimaginable fortune. And yet you would squander it. Now, they may have been 
I don't quite remember. They may have been called uh, activated like uh, sometime after it was all over. I'm trying to remember if they were not, not activated at that, yeah. all, but during the attack, they were not activated and they could have been there before if they'd been activated when Chris Stevens made that first call from his compound saying we're under attack um, and they were watching on the feed. They were watching those terrorists, um, you know, storm the special mission compound and overwhelm um, the Americans there long before, you know, the attack happened at the annex, the secondary location. If they had called the FEST team by design, they were created and funded specifically to be there in time to deal with that. And they were not activated. Fast emergency response team or foreign emergency, what, what's the FER? Fast. Fast emergency response, response team. Hmm. Well, you can look it up. I think it's even on the um, Defense Department, State Department websites, some, one of the two, or maybe both okay. at this point. Do you, know, it up for a while. do you know when they have been activated and deployed? Have you got examples of that? I don't. Well, I do have one, but I... Um, I don't think I can talk about it. Okay. And you, you gave the example, US soil embassies around the world. So would they, is there one place in the US they're activated from? Are there are a number of launch <laughs> ads. Well, those, those, you know, things, uh, locations and things like that, those are all classified. Okay. Okay. So that was one that you've shared with us. Could you share a second one with us out of the many, probably 10, 12 examples you have? What, of different types of technology? Yeah, please. Uh, well, um, for example, we have uh, stealth technology. Mm -hmm. Um that is both manned and unmanned. Okay. That the, the thermal stealth drones that we have, um, I was told by numerous different sources, uh, military sources, um, some special operators, some intelligence uh, people and others, um, that that capability alone could destroy every single armored vehicle, Humvee, MRAP, aircraft, helicopter, you name it, everything that the Taliban took from the US and its allies and uh, the Afghan uh, armed forces could be destroyed overnight by thermal uh, stealth drones that no one would ever see. What do those look like in the sky? If you, don't, you don't even see them. Huh. I remember um, I mentioned about the Space Force flag ceremony with President Trump with POTUS in the Oval Office. And um, he specifically spoke very deliberately. And I think there were a lot of codes with it. Well, there were, but it's interesting what you're saying now. He, he said that there were a number of, so he had people from the Space Force command. He said, if, whether people like it or not, the future is space. And he kept going on and on about it. And he shows the Space Force flag. And the Space Force flag is the arrowhead, which is the same symbol as, as Star Trek. Um, and uh, he talked about missiles and, and weapons. And he says, and he kept repeating, he says, we have, a, all these other countries have, you know, really quick missiles. But we have, we have one that is um, 17 times quicker than any, anyone. He says, mm -hmm. uh, and he kept repeating the word 17, 17 is Q, et cetera. But he kept saying it over and over again. But he's saying, yeah, it's faster than anything out there. And it's 17 times quicker than anyone, you know, anything that either everyone else has got or we had. I think he was in a, I think he was making the point that the US was behind China and Russia and other places, and theirs was a bit faster. But then this one that they've got now because of Space Force was 17 times quicker. And he kept re-emphasizing that all the time. So I think it was loaded with code, but also 
it could be that he's actually talking literally um <laughs> and either either in that ceremony he, he's talked about it or in another occasion he talks about all these different weapons that they have and he said there's one that you just wouldn't believe he said there's one we have you wouldn't even believe what what is possible what can be done and um, obviously that makes you question and think well what is that that could be done but he was he was he was making a point that they've got some kind of mystery so you know what protection that no one would even understand what it is you just just think about that for a moment right um no other president ever talked like that and of course um if you hate trump um, and you hated him and you believed that he was a big liar and, you know, he lied about everything and he exaggerated everything and blah, 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 blah. Um, then you didn't even listen to what he was saying. You just hated him. Um, but on the other hand, uh, imagine for a moment that no other president has shared with the people things like that. Um, yeah. It is very possible that we have weapons like he's talking about, but people don't normally talk about them. It's not only is it a break with convention, right? For oh. which which was used as a sword of Damocles, right? <clears throat> Against him by his uh, enemies. You can't break with convention. It's not allowed, it's not allowed, it's not allowed. Um, but on the other hand, um, what what people are missing when they're blinded like that is other things of great significance with Space Force. For example, when Trump declassified Space Force, nobody thinks about the fact that you had an entire command that the entire United States didn't know about. The people had mm. no idea about. People in the military had no idea about. How long had it been in existence? It had, I think, a budget of 69, 70, uh, billion dollars mm. and for people who are unfamiliar with how the United States government works what that actually means is that President Trump took 69 or 70 billion dollars of dark money and he put it in the light mm. so <clears throat> when people would say oh you know Trump said he was going to drain the swamp and look at him he's the swampiest creature there is and he's got this guy and he's got that guy and he's done nothing there is no greater single act of draining the swamp than to take $70 billion of dark money and mm. put it under the spotlight. Because mm. all of those people on the left and on the right, Democrats and Republicans, who are getting kickbacks and who are getting money, all the defense contractors, all of the people who are the recipients of you know, massive parts of that $70 billion budget, They've gone now from zero accountability to 100% public accountability. Mm. If the oversight committees and the budget committees and, you know, the defense committees and so on and so on, if the government does its job, they now have to be accountable for things that they were not accountable for before that. They don't like that in Washington. They don't like it on the left and they don't like it on the right. So, mm. you know, I always get... Um, it's so frustrating that people get so blinded by uh, their hatred of Trump, whether it's justified or not justified. I really don't care um, in one in this sense. Right. That's another conversation. But but for to get people to look at the principle of what you're actually talking about, this is a very powerful thing. And beyond that, what Trump was doing was saying, why is this secret? Why is the existence of this program? A secret. Mm -hmm. This is a government of the people, uh, by the people, and for the people. Mm -hmm. And we don't need to keep it a secret from them or from the rest of the world what we're doing in space. Sure, there are aspects of the program, like our most advanced weapons, that we need to keep secret for operational security reasons, for national security reasons. But we don't have to hide the fact that we are there because, number one, all of our adversaries already know it. Mm. You think the Chinese didn't know we had a space force or the Iranians or the Russians and so on and so on, right? It's ridiculous. So it, it becomes a bigger question that we forget to ask because we get caught up in arguing, you know, this and that about Trump. Why was this kept secret? 
from the American people. We put Neil Armstrong on the moon. That wasn't a secret, right? And really, if you think about it, we're supposed to believe that after putting Neil Armstrong on the moon, we never went back. We just decided to go to the moon once. And then we decided, oh, we're going to concentrate on going into Mars, deeper into space. Let's go into deep space. Come on. It's not even logical. And yet all of us fall for these things, me included, you know, we because we have this innate faith in our leaders and in our institutions and in our media and our government. We know that they lie and this and that. But we sort of think that there's a threshold below which they won't go. Well, that used to be the case. Anyway, it's not the case anymore. Um, and it's a very important question. Why was Space Force classified in the first place? Because that army that government actually belongs to the people. And guess who finances it? Guess who pays for it? That $70 billion, it doesn't come out of a magic government fund or some gold fountain that, you know, the Democrats and the Republicans somehow create. Um, it comes from the blood, sweat, and tears of the American people. It comes from the working man who has been, and woman, obviously, who has been demonized and now cast out, um, pushed to the fringes of conspiracy for daring to read some of those publications that push, you know, crazy disinformation and misinformation. Now, now, you know, now condemned as domestic terrorists um, who have been called everything under the sun. And what they want you to forget is that it is the blood, sweat and tears and the hard work um, of these people that pay for it. You know why? Number one, because they don't want to be accountable. And number two, because they don't want hard work to be a vehicle through which we can rise and improve our lives. And through which that gives us hope and through which we aspire to be something better. They want us to accept our lot. You will accept your place. It is a place of equity, where there will be only one school of thought, there will be only one ideology, there'll be only one right way to approach anything, to say anything, to do anything, no critical thinking allowed, no diverse opinions allowed. Oh, and guess what the third thing is going to be? You will do as you're told. You will do as you're told. And we will have absolute control over that. And, uh, and we are no longer accountable to you, right? The government no longer serves you. You serve this thing called the government, which is all seeing and all knowing and all powerful and better than us in every respect and knows better than us, knows how to parent our children better than we do, knows what's good for us more than we do, knows what's good for us to eat, good for us to watch, how much sleep we can get. Look, you've got a little device. If you've got a Fitbit or something like that, personally, I would take it and smash it with a hammer. I don't need Apple or Google to tell me when I'm putting on weight. I've got two eyes and I can figure it out myself. Government, ment, mental, governing of the mind. That's what it is. So, well, Laura, it's been a real pleasure today. We should, um, we should do this again if you're up for it, because I think there's plenty more discussions to have. Um, any concluding, thank you. Any concluding message or thought or statement you wanted to leave with the viewers? Yes. Um, you referred to the fact that these are uncharted waters, right? Mm. They really are uncharted waters. And um, what I think is uh, probably some of the biggest lies that are facing Americans and the world today. It's really important for people outside of this country to know that United States servicemen, the veterans of the armed forces, when they sign up, they take an oath to protect the constitution. It's a really odd thing, the constitution and the American Republic, because it doesn't exist in that form anywhere else with that history and that weight and that influence and significance. And I spent a lot of time blindly, you know, reporting all over the globe and wondering why, you know, democracy after democracy um, produced such tyranny, you know, and, and then I realized that democracy is inevitably a tyranny of the majority if it is democracy without a republic. 
It's the Republic in the United States of America that puts the limits on democracy. You know, if the Shia are the majority tribe in Iraq, the Shia will always rule and so on and so on. You can apply that to anywhere in the world and to any democracy. But when you have a republic and proportional representation and you have a system which says that every, you know, every state in America is equal when it comes to deciding who will rule it. So whether you, you know, we look at it from afar and we say, why don't you have the popular vote in America? I thought you believe in one man, one vote. That's not democracy. That's not, you know, equal rights. Well, what they don't tell you is that in every state, in every county, they do have one man, one vote. It is the popular vote in your county and in your state. And but when the states are one, when a state goes red or a state goes blue, they then have proportional and equal representation, an equal voice in deciding who is going to rule. Otherwise, based on population alone, the two cities of New York and California, I mean, nobody else needs to vote, right? I mean, Pete Buttigieg, who's the mayor of Indiana, who's talking about getting rid of the electoral college in America, which elects the president based on electoral college votes based on the popular vote in every county in their state. People like Pete Buttigieg, his name would never be known. Nobody would care. Nobody in Indiana would even need to bother to vote if you didn't have the Republic and the electoral college. And so um, I, I just, I would urge people to uh, look at these things with open, minds and with open hearts and to try to figure out what re America really is about. Because this idea that America is built by New York and Washington or the East and West Coast and everything in the middle it belongs in the dustbin of history and is the, you know, uh, sort of the armpit of the world and uh, the trash heap of nations, right? It's not true. You know, America was built by people in every state, in every city, in every town, and people of every race. It wasn't only one race that built it and others um, that did nothing. That's not how it works. And the rewriting of history is the rewriting of history. Of course, things have been left out of history and you know, uh, portrayed in, in misleading ways and all of those things. All of us want the truth. We all want the truth. And so, um, of course, those things should be addressed and we should be made whole, right? Because we want the whole truth. Only the whole truth makes us whole. And so all of us should want that. But what is something really important for people to know is that the veterans of the United States of America who took an oath, they don't take an oath to a party and they don't take an oath to a certain president. They take an oath to the constitution. And today in America, if you believe in the Constitution and you believe in the Republic and you believe in the flag and the national anthem, you are basically signing your own death warrant, right? Or prison sentence because you are now tantamount to being a domestic terror threat. And that is a false construction. That's, it's based on lies. It absolutely is based on lies. So don't fall for all the press that says America is going to be dragged into a you know, a, a domestic terror event by white supremacists. It is not true. They are setting the stage. It's, it's information warfare, shaping the environment so that when some kind of attack does happen, if some kind of attack happens, they can blame it on someone and it's everybody believes it. It's like telling everyone going into the 2020 election, when the polls close, Donald Trump is going to be winning. When the voting begins, Donald Trump is going to be winning. When the voting is, you know, um, pretty much done, Donald Trump is going to be winning. But when you add in those late absentee ballots, Biden's going to win. Well, amazingly, that's exactly what happened, right? Except that if you look at it statistically and you look at it in detail and you see, you know, where you've got you've got a certain trajectory of votes and a certain number for Biden and a certain number for Trump. And then suddenly the polls close and overnight there's nothing. And when they open again, there's been a dump of, of mail-in ballots and there's zero for Trump 
And everything is for Biden, a statistic impossibility anyway, in a country where elections are so close and closely contested. So, and I'm not going to go into the minutiae of the many uh, different, you know, ways in which uh, they can alter and shape the results that they want. Um, it happens on both sides, and it's been happening for years in the United States. Um, so I'm not making a grand political statement on that. Um, I'm just showing you how they use information warfare to set uh, a certain narrative and shape people's opinions and shape our minds. And what shaping is going on right now is that Russia is going to invade Ukraine. World War Three is inevitable. And we have to prepare for this inevitability. And Putin is a maniac who wants to, you know, to do all of this. And there's only one way to stop him. None of these things are absolute. None of those things are true. It, war over Ukraine is not inevitable. And, um, and there is some real serious concerns that were being set up for uh, false flag events, both on a national sea or not um, in the place and not in a place that we recognize, not in a place we've ever been before. Australia and Canada, you know, have turned, become more tyrannical overnight than Saddam Hussein's Iraq in some ways, not in every way, of course, mm -hmm. but in many ways, in terrifying ways. And that's a shock. Mm -hmm. So what I would say to people is don't play into their hands. Don't be deceived. Think critically. Don't take me at face value. Don't take Tom or anybody else. Um, investigate it and look for yourself. I know it's hard. People who are working two, three jobs or who are the backbone of every society, they don't necessarily have the time to immerse themselves in these things. But don't be deceived, right? Don't walk blindly. What does is, what is Dylan Thomas say? Rage rage against the dying Fine. of the light of the, yeah yeah and i don't mean in <laughs> uh, 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 let's be very clear here i am talking in peaceful legal terms the united states constitution provides the citizens of this country with every legal means that are they need to protect themselves and their freedoms and this country I don't know how it is in every country, everywhere in the world, but I would never want people to do anything but to be peaceful and honorable and dignified and decent and uh, legal, right? So uh, I want to be very, very clear about that. But this is uh, a moment we have never faced before in our lifetimes. I have children and there are days my children are the most important thing to me in the whole world. There are days I've looked to the skies and asked God how I could have done this to them, to bring them into the world at this moment. But on the other side of that, this is a moment where we get to do something that hasn't been done for a very long time. And that's where we get to redefine ourselves based on principles of human decency and good. So I'm a journalist. All I can do then is take the principles of real journalism and what is journalism is meant to be at its core when it is, uh, when it's noble and honest and decent and, uh, and everything that we aspire to be real journalists aspire to be. It's to take those principles and standards and hold on to them and preserve them because we're heading into a different age and a different time. And if we go forward without those things, that time ahead, we've already lost half the battle. If we give up on those things and we don't believe that they exist anymore and we don't fight for them. And surrender is precisely what they want you to do. They want you to give up because they can never, ever deceive all of us. They can't. And the real power is with the people. That's it, Dom. Thanks, Laura. I agree, the future is bright. Um, and I don't know if I necessarily was, was 
meant to come across as saying everyone's asleep. I don't believe everyone is is asleep. Uh, I believe there's factions where some are more awake and yes. different levels of, of awakeness. But um, maybe we're and you didn't that, say everyone. You yeah. you just said you know I know most people are still you know not awake, but um, yeah, it I can feel like that compared to, to yeah compared to. I mean, even within the movement, there's different different levels of awareness, and people have a, a proclivity to certain pieces of truth than others. So, I think we're maybe closer on that point than that. But it's been a pleasure, and we will do it again. And God bless you, and thank you for your thank courage you, and faith. And uh, I'll see you soon. Never surrender, Tom. Never surrender. Never, not to the Never. last breath. Well, I'm not surrendering, so <laughs> that's good. Thanks, Laura. God bless you. Take care. You Thank too. You. Ciao. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>